<laughs> Great, yeah, so thank you again for uh, welcoming me here with you. It's a um, pleasure to be here at St. Mark's. Kind of a spe special place in my heart for the community here. I've been here multiple occasions for uh, sacraments and gotten to know uh, Father Roberto and Father Alvaro and um, Deacon Adam and all the others as well. And um, thanks to, to Brother David for helping to organize this. Um, it's also a nice little bit to get outside of the university. It's nice to have a connection between the parish and the university. I think a lot of ways the parish is the, the heart of, of our Catholic culture and Catholic community. So it's nice to be able to, to engage with you and to share some of what I've been learning and hopefully that can bear some fruit in your lives. Um, so let us pre begin uh, by asking the intercession of our Blessed Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Great, thanks. Yes, and as, uh, as Brother David kind of started to discuss a little bit about the mission of Catholic studies, um, and some of you may know, but it's, it's very much an integrative academic endeavor, so it brings together Catholic theology and philosophy, history and the arts. Um, I guess one way to describe it is the Catholic intellectual tradition broadly. Um, and Dr. Boyle, who's one of the founders, I think put it well when he said that um, the subject matter of Catholic studies uh, is the, the impact of the incarnation on Catholic thought and culture. And one aspect of, um, of culture today that I think Catholic studies can shed light on um, is that of secularization. Um, and secularization is a vast topic and, and, and too big of a topic to really, to really grasp in a, in a presentation. Um, but I think we all have a sense of, of the importance of, of the topic and have a sense that kind of we're living in a, in a secularized world and we don't really have a, a clear understanding of, of what that is. What is this secularized society? And what does it mean for me in my life and how I live out um, in this culture? So for, for, for my talk tonight, um, just like to, to try and, and provide a framework to begin to think about what is secularization um, and to kind of use the, the integrative methodology of Catholic studies, just going to try and provide a, a brief philosophical perspective, historical perspective, theological perspective, and then bring in some of the arts and, and, some, and some of the presentation of, of those materials. And kind of the goal at the end is to, to try and gain some clarity, uh, to try to gain you know, a, a framework for thinking about se our secular culture. So for, firstly then, the, a philosophical perspective, I'm going to be drawing mainly off of um, the work provided by the Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor. Um, he's kind of regarded as one of the experts in this area. And he, um, he wrote a book called The Secular Age, which is pictured here. And um, his, he starts off the book um, kind of trying to lay out a few different ways that people have understood secularization. Some sort of see it as a change in beliefs, a uh, change in religious practice. Others see it as the evacuation of religion from the public square. But his, uh, his central argument is that secularization is best understood as a change in worldview, uh, or what he calls a change of social imaginary. Um, so this is kind of a change in the background understanding of the world, um, how we see the world and our place in it, which often operates in the background of our thinking, um, but it affects how we live our everyday lives. It affects kind of our beliefs and our understandings. Um, and to illustrate this philosophical principle, this epistemological principle of how we, how we know things and how things show up for us, I'd like to just kind of walk, walk through a little illustration with you guys. So if, you, if you'd bear with me, um, I'd, I'd like to show two different pictures to do two different halves of the room. So I'll ask, let's say everybody on my right, on your left, the left of the room, to close your eyes and everybody on the left to keep them open and to just notice the picture that, that I pull up here. Oh, 
All right, and now if we could do it in the reverse. So everybody on this side of the room, if you could please close your eyes, and everybody on this side that, whose eyes was closed, to open them and look up at the screen. And just make note of the picture that you see here. Great. Now uh, everybody can open their eyes again. And this time I'd like to just run through it one more time, but uh, now this time when, when your eyes are open, just kind of make note of the picture that I show you. What is the central image on that picture? So if this half, again, could, keep your, or could, could close your eyes, and this half, watch the screen. All right, and switch it up. This side closed, this side open, perfect. Just again, just make note of the central image. Okay, now everybody can open, open your eyes. You may be wondering what's going on now, but um, now everyone can keep your eyes open and I'd like to show, um, show everybody both of the images. And again, so this was the first image that half the room saw, and maybe yours may not be. And this is the image that the other half of the room saw. So would somebody on this half of the room, would somebody on this half of the room please tell me what was the image that showed up for you when you saw it? Musicians, the saxophone player, right? I, could I just have a show of hands if that's what you saw? Central image, pretty much everybody, great. And then on this half of the room, what was the central image that you saw? Sorry? In the very center? So, a woman's face? We go back to it. Kind of a woman's face in the center? It's kind of, that one's a little harder, but. Um, but anyways, as you might know, the next, next couple of things here, it's the exact same image in both pictures. So this, this is just, just meant to illustrate that oftentimes how we perceive things is very much shaped by our background understanding. So if, if we have the background understanding picture of um, musicians, then the, the, the image in the center is going to show up to us as a saxophone player. If we have a background understanding as just kind of silhouettes of faces, we're going to see the central image as a face. So this is one of uh, Charles Taylor's kind of his, one of his central um, essential philosophical points that he's trying to, to illustrate to help us to understand how a worldview or a background context is very important for this concept of secularization. And again, his, his, his central point in this book is that the best way to understand secularization is a change in background context or worldview. Um, one from kind of a more religious worldview to one which is a more secular worldview. And he lays out the argument in, in the rest of his book, but that's, um, that will suffice us for now for the philosophical perspective. And so then we may be asking, well, what, well to get a little bit more clarity on what Taylor, me, Taylor means by worldviews, uh, I'd just like to run, few, a few, uh, run through a few more images with you guys to illustrate a few different worldviews that our culture has, has had throughout the ages. Um, and it's, it's obviously you can't do justice to a whole worldview in an image, but it, I think it will give you a sense of the different types of worldviews, the different ways that people have generally seen the world kind of throughout human history and the varieties that these worldviews can take. So just to run through these rather briefly, this is kind of an ancient Hebrew worldview with the firmament in the stars, the heaven of the heavens, the under, underworld. This is kind of how ancient Hebrews saw the world. Um, here's a Babylonian worldview. Here's a Hindu worldview. Just a few more kind of ancient worldviews that you guys may recognize. There's Atlas. There's a co more cosmological. Then we come to kind of some more contemporary worldviews. So how do people in our contemporary age kind of see the world um, that they live in? What is the background worldview that we're operating out of when we live our everyday lives? So this may be a little bit more familiar to people in our age of, of how they see 
the world and our place in it. Um, and there's a little bit, you know, especially with these, oh, that picture must not have came through. But that, <laughs> the picture that was supposed to be here was um, just kind of a universe. So, um, and a lot of times, I think if we would ask most people in our age now, they would probably say something like these represent, um, represent how we picture ourselves in the world. This is, this is the world that we live in. Um, and a lot of this kind of, as Taylor and others would argue, is kind of coming from a more naturalistic, materialistic, maybe physicalistic understanding of our place in the world. Because as you saw in some of the previous pictures in ancient times, um, there was more, uh, there was different, different understanding. It wasn't completely scientific. Their worldviews tried to incorporate other elements of the world um, in terms of gods and their religion. They tried to bring that into a picture of their world worldview. But oftentimes in our contemporary situation, those elements are not present. Um, but sometimes we still kind of, we still have a sense of there's a meaning in the world. The, the one image that, I'm sorry it didn't show up, but it was basically a big universe and it just had a little line that said, you are here. It's basically a little speck in the big universe. So that's kind of one way that we often see ourselves um, is just a little speck in this giant universe and there's not much meaning, um, much, there's not much meaning living in such a world. But oftentimes people have a hard time kind of really living out of that worldview, so they, they still try to combine some of the more naturalistic understanding of the world with some sort of meaning or some sort of ideology, but there's not a real clear sense of how they connect. Um, what is the purpose and, and how does it connect with this naturalistic way that I, that I see the world? So now I'd like to show you kind of a, an image that I think depicts the Catholic worldview. Um, and this is a painting by the Catholic artist um, Raphael, in, um, who, who lived and painted in the late 15th, early 16th centuries. And um, as you see in the center is, is the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, next to him is Mary and all the, the angels and the saints. And then down below you have, you have the heavens and the earth. So there's a, there's a physical dimension, a natural dimension, but also a metaphysical dimension uh, and metaphysical as Dr. Paul can tell you here, as our metaphysics professor at St. Thomas, um, meta means beyond in Greek, so beyond the physical. So the Catholic worldview is very important to include in our vision of reality a metaphysical dimension, a supernatural dimension, which oftentimes in our contemporary world we, d we don't live out of, we don't um, in include that. Um, and then obviously then you have the sacraments too in, in, in the scriptures in the middle here. Um, connecting the heavens and the earth. So we have access to the metaphysical and the supernatural. And, um, so I think that does a good job at depicting the Catholic worldview. Um, and so now, Taylor's main point in his book is kind of secularization is best understood as the shift in worldview from one of which is more like the Catholic worldview in Western civilization, which was the, the predominant worldview, which people just lived their ordinary lives out of, to one kind of the more contemporary worldviews. Oh, it, it did show up here, so that's good. Um, which, um, so this is the back, basically the background context out of which we live our everyday lives. Um, and it situates our understandings, our beliefs, um, kind of influences how we act, and so, for example, you know, in the, in the Catholic worldview, recall again that, that exercise we did at the beginning, the background context influences how things show up for us in the world. So if you're operating out of a Catholic worldview, you're going to have a very different understanding of what man is than if you're operating out of one of the more secular, naturalistic worldviews. In the Catholic worldview, uh, what is man is going gonna, is gonna to be something that's we're connected with a metaphysical reality, with God himself, with the angels and the saints. Um, but in one of these more secular worldviews, uh, what is man but he's just kind of a, a conglomeration of atoms, um, just a speck in a, in a vast universe, and um, it's hard to find much meaning to life there. At best, um, you know, there's, there's some sort of meaning to life that you can derive from a secular worldview about, you, know, you can have some sort of sense of 
wanting to make the world a better place, but it's not really grounded in anything that you can understand. Um, so that's a philosophical perspective of, of uh, this process of secularization. And now I'd like to, so then that leads to the question of, of how did we get, how did this whole process occur from um, shifting our worldview from a secular one, uh, from a Catholic one to a secular one. And, um, and, and so to answer that question, it, it's helpful to turn to kind of a more historical perspective of how this process took place of this shifting worldviews. And the thinker that I think is very helpful for, for working through this historical perspective is Brad Gregory. And he's a, he's a Catholic historian uh, who's also very in, influential in this area of study, the study of secularization. Um, and his main argument is that the Western world today is an extraordinarily complex, tangled product of rejections, retentions, and transformations of medieval Western Christianity in which the Reformation era constitutes the critical watershed. So he, his main argument is that it's, it was kind of this whole process started by um, doctrinal disputes, essentially, in the Reformation era um, that have had these long-term unintended consequences, he calls it, and have slowly shifted our worldview, the prevailing worldview of our Western culture. And again, his, you know, he lays out his argument in a whole book, and we can just kind of cover some of the highlights here in, in, in broad strokes. But um, we'll start with Martin Luther, who clearly is kind of uh, very influential in these, in these doctrinal disputes during the Reformation, um, the first reformer. Um, and, and a lot of people who tell his story indicate that a lot of, a lot of his, his, uh, his problems with, with the church and a lot of these dis doctrinal disputes came out of his, his personal, ex largely came out of his personal experience in his life. And, um, and one of the things that's often noted is he had an intense desire um, for certainty of his salvation. He wanted to know for sure that he was saved. Great, thank you. Um, and he had an experience of, of being saved, um, being, you know, saved by grace through faith. And, and so then, you know, he kind of um, promoted his doctrine um, that salvation were saved by grace through faith. And this was, um, you know, this didn't jive with the Catholic teachings. And so in some ways, you know, for this reason and for others, this again is an oversimplification. You know, it led to his break from the from the Catholic Church, um, which he justified by kind of more doctrinal disputes, um, saying you know, kind of kind of arguing that the Church doesn't have the authority that the Church has has been understood to have had, um, and that kind of Scripture is is the source of authority. Uh, scripture alone is a source, source, uh, source of authority. And um, so some of these doctrinal disputes that began with Luther and, and some of the other reformers, um, Gregory argues, has kind of started this trend and, and started this trend in shifting our background worldview. And as you can kind of see in the, the image a little bit, um, that part of some of these, doc, how these doctrinal disputes changed the worldview. If this was the Catholic worldview, you know, it, it, it um, emphasized the, the role of Scripture in the middle, so it kept that, it kept that but um, it, it de-emphasized the role of the sacraments, um, so there's no longer the Eucharist there, and then, you know, the role of the saints um, was, because of these doctrinal disputes, and these doctrinal differences, was Neglect, neglected, um, and then you know the bishops down here with their hats, they were kind of taken off. Everybody's on the same level. It was kind of this this priesthood of all believers that Luther promoted. So you see it, how some of these doc, doctrines started to shift shift the worldview that was widely held um, before the time of the Reformation. And some of the main trends that are often noted in the, in this in this process is kind of a subjectivism, um, which is often noted, began with Luther. Um, 
as, as I mentioned, kind of this, this, this experience of being saved by grace through faith, faith was kind of came to him in the subjective experience of just being saved, um, which was a bit of a departure from previous times, which was kind of more based on objective reality and kind of receiving the, the faith and the doctrines of the church rather than coming out of subjective experience. And another kind of trend that uh, the Reformation set in motion uh, was um, uh, so subjectivism was one, and then another one was anti-traditionalism. Again, as a priest of, priesthood of all believers, there, there, was, there wasn't kind of as prominent of a role of the priests. Again, again they and, and people in the church, you know, their their hats were removed, and, and because the sacraments didn't play as large of a role, it was more based on our subjective um, subjective experience and our we were everyone is a pre a priesthood of all believers, and we all have access to God and to, to right teaching through just our reading of scriptures on a more individual level. And so another major figure that kind of continued this trend of secularization, which changed the background worldview, is uh, Rene, Rene Descartes. And um, he's often thought of as the father of modern, modernity, and I think in a lot of ways he continues a lot the trends that were begun during the Reformation, during these doctrinal disputes, and, and brings them to a new level. Um, like Luther, he also had an intense desire for rational certitude. And this time it wasn't so much about his salvation, but it was more about how do I know anything. Um, as a philosopher, he, um, he was kind of plagued by doubt. How can, I, how can I know things when one person says something and, and this other group says something else? So he's trying to find um, a ground for rational certainty. And, um, and eventually, again like Luther, he had a subjective experience um, in an upper room, in an upper chamber, um, of after, trying, after doubting every, everything he could doubt you know, philosophically, well, you know, you would ask questions, well, that can be doubted, so that can't be the ground for certitude. For cert certitude. But he eventually came to something that he couldn't doubt, and that's what's referred to as the cogito. Um, the phrase is, I think, therefore I am. So that was the one bit of truth that he found that he could not doubt. Um, he couldn't doubt that since he was thinking, therefore he exists. Um, so that, that was the one thing that he found, I can't doubt that, so that must be the ground of rational certitude. And, and then, it, then he based all of his, his subsequent thought off of that philosophical principle. And um, he didn't completely, this is again is an oversimplification because on that basis he tried to bring back in God and, and tried to say, you know, bring back a lot of the truths of Christianity, but you know, the trends that he put in motion by some of his principles um, and some of his thinking kind of led to this continued trend of secularization, this continued shifting worldview. Um, so, so, um, so the trend of subjectivism continued, the trend of anti-traditionalism continued. Um, he didn't really have a role even for scripture because that wasn't the ground for, for rational certainty. It was just kind of my subjective experience of, of thinking therefore I am and then building his philosophy based on that um, there wasn't there wasn't the sense of you know the revelation coming down in the center through scripture and through the sacraments um, so he kind of eliminated all that um, in his philosophy and so it, it continued this trend of secularization of flattening out flattening out the world view and kind of in, in a sense eliminating all of the the metaphysical it kept a lot of the physical but eliminated the metaphysical or the supernatural. And, and the last thinker that I'd like to highlight um, as contributing to this, this trend of secularization is Friedrich Nietzsche. And, and I think he's an important figure because in a lot of ways I think he shows us the end point of this process of secularization. If you follow these trends that were begun by Luther and then continued by Descartes, um, of subjectivism, anti-traditionalism, and um, you know, and rationalism, and basing, trying to base all truth in a subjective experience and in reason alone, then um, Nietzsche kind of concluded that you're just led to nihilism. 
there's no real ground for morality. There's no morality at all. all um, we often use moral terms, but ultimately it's just to advance our own interests and our own, as he would call it, will to power. And, and so I think in a lot of ways the nihilism that's represented by Friedrich Nietzsche um, kind of shows the culmination of some of the principles that were put in place by, by Luther and continued by Descartes. Um, and if you follow them to their conclusion, you'll, you'll end in nihilism and kind of a worldview that looks something like this. It's all, again, on the physical level. Um, there's no real meaning. We're just kind of a speck in a vast universe. Um, and there's no real objective morality. It's just people using moral terms to promote their own interests and promote their will to power, as he would call it. So, so that, again, is kind of broad strokes. Um, trying to cover kind of a historical perspective of how this process of secularization occurred. And so finally, then, I'd like to, to share a, a theological perspective. And, um, and I think it's important to note that um, theological perspective isn't really just kind of one perspective among others. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, it serves to, to integrate and synthesize um, a lot of the other perspectives. Um, and I think it's very fitting in, in this picture that I shared with you, which I think depic depicts a Catholic worldview. In the, in the top left of it um, is the image of Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, so it, it's connecting the Genesis, so the, there's a connection with the Genesis account. And in many ways, I think you know, the Genesis account is in, important to keep in mind uh, with the Catholic worldview because in many ways it provides kind of a Catholic meta-narrative um, which explains our human condition. Um, we often think of the Genesis account of the fall as kind of occurring with Adam and Eve, our first parents, but we often, often don't kind of fully recognize that it also continues um, continues in us personally, but also on the cultural level as well. Um, as St. Paul talks, talks about, you know, we're all sinning in Adam. So it's not meant to be just a kind of a one, a, a story of a one-time thing that happened at the beginning of time. Or, um, but it, it's something that provides kind of a meta-narrative, a, a broad narrative that's continuing to happen on our individual lives and on a cultural level with um, kind of the, the history of humanity. Um, so to go back to the Genesis account, as we all know, it began by Adam and Eve, and their, um, as it describes in the, the Bible, their desire to be like God. Um, and they're grasping at the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So they wanted to be like God, and they wanted the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to know like God. Um, and God's knowledge, um, which kind of created the world. In the beginning was the Word, and, and, with the, um, and, and um, through the Word, all things came to be. Um, and the, the word lo, word uh, means, you know, is it, the, the original translation is logos, which means kind of intelligibility. Um, so so we, we, as humans, we can understand the fall as our desire to know like God, which God's knowledge which is, is creative knowledge, is the foundation for all knowledge. Um, clearly, there's kind of a perfect certainty to his knowledge. Um, but it can't be contradicted. Um, so, uh, so one way to understand the fall is us desiring to, be, to know like God and to be like God um, and to have a, a rational certainty. And so we can see that kind of this, this principle, which is kind of playing out, on the, the Catholic meta-narrative of the fall occurring throughout this historical account, which I tried to outline there. Um, and you can see, as we discussed with, with Martin Luther, he also shared this kind of desire for rational certainty um, to know like God. He wanted a rational certainty of his salvation. He was plagued by uh, fears that he wasn't saved and, and scrupulosity. Um, you know, one of his quotes is, if a monk were ever saved by monkishness, I was that monk. Um, so 
he was plagued by not being sure, not being certain that he was saved, that he was going to go to heaven. And um, so in many ways, this, this mirrors kind of our fallen human tendency in Adam to have rational certainty. And likewise with uh, Rene Descartes, um, he had, you know, as I mentioned too, a desire for rational certitude. And, um, and rather than trying to re- kind of receiving truth, from God and from the church, um, you know, he, he tried to find the foundation for truth in himself, which again, going back to the, the principles of the fall like Adam and Eve, rather than kind of receiving, receiving life from God, we grasp, we grasp at life and we, we grasp that rational certain certitude and, and kind of turned in on ourselves, um, which is, is, is depicted, I think, by um, Rene Descartes' philosophy of his subjectivism. He turned inward to try and find rational certitude. Um, tried to find, um, rather than receiving truth from God, he tried to build his whole philosophy out in his own subjective experience of, of thinking and realizing that he exists. Um, and also, like the, um, you know, the Catholic meta-narrative of, of the fall, the consequence of this, of us grasping at the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, um, was that just like our, our, our first parents, Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, were, were cut off from heaven. Um, and as you can see in the Catholic world, or in the, the, the secularized worldview, um, you know, there's, there's certain elements that are being cut off from us when we, when we make these moves um, in our philosophy and, and how we understand ourselves. Um, we're cut off from the angels and the saints, um, from the sacraments, which is kind of God's presence among us. We start to be cut off from these things as a consequence of, our, of the fall, which we're participating in in this historical trend. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we're cut off from, from, um, from God himself and from divine revelation. We can no longer hear his voice, just like Adam and Eve in the garden were, were cut off from God. They used to walk in easy fellowship with them and, and talk with them, but now they're, you know, become cut off, cut off from that and we're completely kind of living in, a, in, a physical, in the physical realm outside of the garden of heaven. Um, so I think that Catholic meta-narrative helps to helps to provide the theological perspective of, of what's going on in this whole process of secularization. And ultimately, oh, we're missing another one. But this picture was, um, was just how, sharing how, um, again, going back to the, the broad world view. Let's see if we can find it here. It was basically going back to the universe with just you are here. And, and so just like in the, um, in the Genesis account, um, God told Adam and Eve, um, if you eat this fruit, you will die. And so it's, it's very fitting that um, kind of the culmination of this process of secularization kind of ended in nihilism, which is nothingness. So... so um, so in many ways, it, it, again, it maps on to the Catholic meta-narrative of the fall. So by us, throughout this cultural process of grasping for knowledge um, and, being cu- and cutting ourselves off from, from a, a, a metaphysical or supernatural realm, you know, the end or culmination of that is nihilism, is kind of Nietzschean philosophy of all there is is just a will to power. There's no real morality. There's no real meaning in the universe. We're just a speck in the universe. And um, so that, that brings the theological perspective to a close. And again, I think you know, putting it in that context helps to, helps to bring things together. Um, and in, just in conclusion, I'd like to say that you know, we, li- we are living in a secular age. Um, we often have the worldview. We often are not living in this worldview. We're living in the, the worldview of um, just a speck in the universe, um, just kind of living on, in the in the physical reality, not connected to metaphysical and supernatural reality. We're not often living our lives out of this sort of worldview. Um, we often kind of in our thoughts in. in 
and in our actions, we don't see ourselves as connected with kind of the heavenly hosts. And, um, you know, we're, it, that's often kind of not going on uh, in the background of, of, of our actions. So, um, so I think this is an, something that's important for us to be aware of. Um, and I'd encourage everybody here uh, just to ask yourselves and think critically uh, about your own worldview and uh, what is the background understanding of the world um, or all of reality that you hold that is often kind of unthinkingly informing your understandings and your beliefs um, and ultimately shaping your actions and the way you live your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if you could kind of attempt to represent that worldview in an image, what would it look like? Um, and to kind of challenge yourself, would it look something like this? You know, would, 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 um, you know, would the very center of your worldview be God, the, the Holy Trinity, you know, with Mary and all the angels and the saints and the, the sacraments kind of being in, in the Word and Revelation being our essential link? Um, is that kind of what's prominent in, in how we think about the world in all of reality? Um, and if it's not, um, I guess I'll, I'd leave you with the Lenten challenge to repent. Um, and repent in the, in, the true sen in the original sense of that word, um, which was originally uh, metanoiate, which in Greek, again, meta means beyond, and, and nous means mind. So go beyond your mind. Um, so my, my challenge would be, you know, if, if, you, ask, if you, you, you honestly answer this question that this is not my worldview, I think this Lent would be a good time for us to, to repent, to, to go beyond our minds um, and to try to conform our mind more fully to Christ's mind um, and to try to, to try to live out of a worldview like this and let it shape, shape our thoughts and shape our beliefs and shape our actions. So, um, so let us just close again in prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.